I think it's right. Great. Yes. So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the introduction and for organizing this event. I'm very happy to, he to be here on this uh, evening, giving you an introduction about my research area. And to do this, I will take you on a journey backwards in time, all the way to the very beginning of the universe. Now you might wonder, why do we even think that there is a beginning? For many centuries, the universe was assumed or believed to be completely static and eternal. So what changed? Well, believing that it was static is not so surprising when you start thinking about just how far you have to look to learn anything useful about its long-term history. Let's see, for example, this beautiful night sky, which you unfortunately won't get the chance to see tonight, but the picture makes up for it. It might seem like you can see stars all the way to infinity, like there are so many of them. But actually, all the stars that you can see with the naked eye are concentrated in this relatively small zone of our own galaxy. And even though looking at astronomical objects is like looking at the past, because the light from those objects takes time to reach us, those 16,000 years compared to the scale of the age of the universe are really not that much. At the beginning of the 20th century, we started being able to measure astronomical distances better. We used uh, stars with fixed brightness, like supernovae with a fixed amount of energy, to calibrate astronomical distances. And with this technique, we were able to find out that some fuzzy regions, like the ones here on the left, were actually much, much further away than any star. And we concluded that those were galaxies outside of our own similar to our own, and, there are, and that there is a really large number of them. And the, the first uh, really major cosmological breakthrough happened when we started being able not just to measure the distance, but also the speed at which those galaxies are moving. To do this, we use a phenomenon that is well known that's called the Doppler effect. And you are actually really familiar with it from uh, daily life situations. For example, when an ambulance is passing you in the street, when it's coming close to you, the sound waves that it's emitting are getting compressed and you hear a high-pitched sound. But after it's passed you, when it goes away, the sound drops to a lower pitch. Similarly, light is a wave and the equivalent for light of high-pitched is a blue color, while the equivalent of low-pitched is uh, shifted towards the red. So if we're looking at a distant galaxy and um, the light it's emitting looks a little bit bluer than we would expect, it might mean that it's coming towards us. While if uh, the light is shifted more towards the red, then the galaxy is going away. So this uh, measurement was first conducted in the late 1920s by uh, Hubble and Lemaitre, and they found two very important things there. First of all, almost all of the galaxies that we can observe are going away from us. And second of all, the further away a galaxy is, the faster it is escaping. Now, if we look at this little diagram on the right, what that means is that the universe as a whole, space-time itself, is expanding. And this was the first uh, piece of uh, observational evidence that the universe is in fact not eternal, that it is dynamic, evolving, and that it might have a beginning. So if we look uh, at this stage at what's, what we know of the universe, if at the present time it is expanding, we can trace that back in time and we deduced that in the past, the universe must have been smaller, which also means that it was denser and hotter, all the way to the moment where all the energy, all the matter that we know today was concentrated in one single point. So now to this day, we still do not have any way of imagining, understanding or describing this initial singularity. But on the way there, there are some really important transitions that we can actually try to describe and to understand. The first one has to do with the states of matter. So on Earth, we are familiar with three main states of matter. If we have a temperature scale here, of course, at low temperatures, we've got solids where atoms are closely linked together and arranged in crystals. Then we've got liquids where the links are still there, but looser. After that, if we raise the temperature, we have gas where the atoms are not linked together anymore and they're moving at higher speeds. Now, if you look at one of those atoms, it's made of a nucleus and of electrons orbiting around it. So if we raise the temperature even further, there is actually a fourth state of matter in which these bonds between electrons and nuclei break. And we have a cloud of fast moving, electrically charged particles, free electrons and free nuclei. We call that a plasma. So if our theory is correct, and the universe was increasingly hot and dense in the past, there must have been a time, if we look far enough, where it was in a state of plasma. And what this means um, is that we cannot see through 
this state because any particle of light, any photon that was emitted in this primordial plasma would bounce off of the free electrons in many different random directions without being able to travel any long distance and without being able to reach us. So this means that this phase of the universe was completely opaque. And only as the universe expanded enough and cooled down enough for the first atoms to form was light finally able to free stream and potentially reach distances, uh, cosmological distances and reach us. So the light emitted right at this time of transition is actually the oldest observable signal in the entire universe and anything before that cannot be seen directly. So now uh, let's look at some characteristics of this first light. We now know that the age of the universe is over 13 billion years. And uh, we have been able to determine that this time of transition between plasma and gas, between opaque and transparent, happened when it was only 300,000 300, years old. So we've made a big leap back in the past there. But of course, at the time the theory was developed, we didn't know such precise numbers. But what we were already able to tell is that a large amount of time had passed and a large amount of expansion had happened. So that the initially very hot, very energetic radiation emitted at this time when the temperature was about 3000 Kelvin has been redshifted, has been stretched towards longer wavelengths, uh, lower temperatures. And these long wavelengths are now in the microwave range. Yes, that's the same kind of waves as in your microwave oven. So we call this the cosmic microwave background. Another characteristic of this radiation, uh, the, the reason we called it a background, is that it comes from every direction in the sky, more or less uniformly. And its uh, first observational detection, its first detection was a complete accident. It's actually quite a funny story. Those two scientists here, uh, Arno Pendias and Robert, Robert Wilson, were working on this radio antenna that's behind them. And this antenna was not built for cosmological purposes at all. It was built to detect signals from communication satellites. And they were in charge of calibrating the antenna, removing all kinds of interferences, but they kept detecting this constant noise from every direction in the sky, uniform, about the same intensity. And they could not understand what it was from. At first, they suspected that a pigeon's nest in the antenna was causing it to malfunction. But after chasing the pigeons and cleaning up everything that they could, the noise was still there. Around the same time, a theory paper detailing some of the predicted characteristics of the CMB came out. They read, they read it, made the connection. One decade later, they won the Nobel Prize. Lucky coincidence. So, of course, after this first detection, there was a lot of excitement around the CMB and to try to measure and understand more of its properties. Uh, one of the main properties that we could predict is that this primordial plasma at the start of the universe was uh, more or less uniform, had about the same temperature everywhere. It was in a state of what we call thermal equilibrium. And we have really precise theoretical prediction for what the emission from this kind of system looks like. So this graph, you can uh, read it as the intensity of the light as a function of the wavelengths, frequencies, the, the inverse of wavelengths. So just this is uh, how intense the CMB light is in different kind of wavelengths. And the blue line was our theoretical prediction uh, for black body spectrum. The red points are a measurement. You can see this is an incredibly good match. And it was actually said at the time that the CMB was the most perfect black body ever observed. And this was, of course, groundbreaking evidence in favor of the Big Bang theory because it really confirmed that the universe was once small and dense enough to be too hot for atoms. Now, going a step further, instead of just looking at the overall intensity, overall temperature of this CMB light, Let's try to map it. So we sent a satellite to space and we, this is actually the whole sky projected over this, this elliptical shape. Just to clarify, this is what we could see over the whole sky. It looks like there are some fluctuations in the temperature and intensity of the CMB. So that's interesting. And over the next two decades, we built better satellites and our picture became clearer and even clearer. This is one of the most recent ones. So. What I want to draw your attention to now is the scale here. This is essentially a picture of what the universe looked like over 13 billion years ago. And we are able to distinguish fluctuations in its temperature of the order of a few millions of a degree. Quite mind blowing, isn't it? So this map raised a few very interesting questions. The first one, of course, we see all of those fluctuations that look kind of random. 
Where do they come from? What created them? That's quite straightforward. The second main question is a little bit less obvious, but let me walk you through it. So this uh, area that you see here, I don't have a very good pointer, but that, that kind of cone shape, this is what we call a light cone. And it represents uh, the portion of the universe from which light can reach us in a given amount of time. So of course you see it grow with time because the further we look in the past, the further away we can see. And because a really long amount of time has passed since the emission of the CMB, um, we can see a really large area and points that are separated by very big distances, like for example these A and B that I showed here. However, between the emission of the CMB and time zero, whatever that means, there's not a lot of time in comparison. So if we trace back the light cones of those points A and B, they never really overlapped. This means that the points A and B never had the chance to exchange any kind of information or to be in any kind of contact. How come they have the same average temperature then? How come they're in equilibrium if they've never been in contact? That was what we called the horizon problem. And to answer these two questions, plus some other questions that I don't have time to mention now, but you can ask me later, uh, one way of answering those questions is to introduce a very brief, very violent phase of accelerated expansion right after the birth of the universe. In this scenario, the diagram on the right is correct up to a tiny fraction of a second. But before that, those points A and B might have been really close together and able to communicate, but would have been then separated by the very fast expansion. This scenario, we call it cosmic inflation. But this, um, the picture here, it's very informative, but it really doesn't do to the size. This is an atom nucleus, the size of a proton. And let's blow that up 26 times. So each arrow is a factor of 10. We're zooming out and out and out. So now we're getting towards some kind of molecules, DNA, some kind of cells, biological systems. Now we're slowly approaching the scales that we are familiar with on Earth in our daily lives. Then zooming out and out and out, maybe what we would see from a plane, even the size of uh, about a continent. And soon we are leaving the Earth, still zooming out. The moon is passing us by, some asteroids, and the inner solar system planets. So that's, that's time 10 to the 26 expansion. We've, went, we've gone from the size of a proton to the entire inner solar system in the span of a tiny fraction of a second. Doesn't that sound a little bit insane? So the obvious question now is, what kind of physical phenomenon can possibly explain this? And even though it does sound quite insane, there are plausible candidates. What we need to produce this kind of expansion is we need the universe to be dominated by a kind of particle that can produce negative pressure, because with negative pressure, we can create accelerated expansion. And those types of particles that we call scalar fields, we know that they exist because there's at least one of them that we have detected. The Higgs boson might have heard of that. That's a scalar field. Some theories say that the Higgs boson could be the inflaton field, but many other theories assume that uh, the inflaton that we call phi here is a completely different particle that we have not detected yet. Now, for inflation to happen as we think it did, we need first, so this is the energy, we need the energy of, of this field to dominate the universe at first. So while this field is dominating, we are expanding very fast. But then we need inflation to end. Of course, inflation is not going on right now, we wouldn't exist if it were. So for it to end, we need the field not to be dominant after a certain amount of time. And as we know, all physical systems are attracted and go towards their state of lowest energy. So if we start in this area here, and the field is dominating at first, but there's a state of lower energy somewhere here, it's going to move and roll slowly towards it. And while it's still dominant, we have inflation. And then at the sharp drop, inflation stops. And then the energy that was once contained in that field gets converted into all of the other particles that form the matter that we know today. So this is a very generic kind of infl inflaton potential. There are actually many possibilities, many theories about the mathematical details of this, what the potential really looks like, what this particle is. And that's why we need better observation to understand which ones of them are plausible. Here's a really interesting kind of extension of this theory. If the potential actually looks like this, so you see, you recognize that same shape here in the yellow part, but we've got this little additional bump. 
we could be in a situation where we have a really large space-time like this, where the inflaton field is dominating almost everywhere in that kind of local minimum there. And it's quite comfortable here, but it's not the state of lower and lowest energy. So in some places, some random time, it might happen that through a quantum process that we call tunneling, the field suddenly takes that lower value, kind of jumps through that barrier here to take that lower value and then starts rolling down and oscillating and creates the inflation that we know. But if it can happen in one place at one time, but in the rest of the space time, it is still in that local maximum, in that local minimum, then maybe in other random places, other random times, it could happen again. So in that theory that we call eternal inflation, we might actually be living in a multiverse. And of course, this is all kind of highly theoretical and there is no observational confirmation or evidence for this yet. This is kind of a fascinating hypothesis to just think about that it might be our universe is kind of just a bubble in a much larger space time that is eternally expanding. So now looking at uh, more concrete things, observational consequences of inflation. What kind of, uh, well, what kind of phenomena does this, this kind of scalar field predict? First of all, we know now that uh, during inflation, we are dealing with a quantum system. We're, we're looking at quantum mechanics, we're looking at microscopic scales. And in quantum systems, the vacuum is never really truly empty. There are what we call fluctuations, where pairs of particles and antiparticles can be spontaneously created for, from nothing. And then they just usually annihilate again right away. So it's as if nothing happened, just a tiny fluctuation. But now you put this in a very fast expanding space time. It can happen that those two particles from the pair get separated by, by inflation before they have the time to annihilate. And then what we see is regions that have slightly more particles, slightly less particles. These are over densities and under densities. And this is exactly what we observe in the cosmic microwave background, random fluctuations of the energy density. And even more than the CMB, what it really explains is all the structure in our universe now. Because if you have slightly overdense regions, then gravity will pull more and more matter towards them. And this is an accelerated view of a cosmological simulation. We start mostly uniform, and then we start aggregating towards the overdense regions, forming what we know now as galaxy clusters, galaxies, stars, planets, us, all of that. Just the results of some random tiny fluctuations in the first tiny fraction of a second of the universe. The second really major prediction from inflation theory is the presence of uh, gravitational waves. So this is another type of quantum fluctuations. You guys are probably mostly familiar with gravitational waves in this setting. You've probably heard a lot on the news about the discovery of binary in spiraling black holes that cause kind of ripples in space time around them. These are the gravitational waves that, that everyone knows, but they can also be produced by quantum fluctuations. If during inflation, there are just tiny variations in the geometry of space-time locally, and they get blown up by expansion, then they become macroscopic gravitational waves that could be detected, potentially. And this is the missing piece. We've seen the density variations, we've seen the structure, we have a lot of evidence in favor of inflation, but this last thing, observing the primordial gravitational waves, would be the proof. It would really show that the inflation scenario is real if we could det detect them. And furthermore, it could uh, tell us what the exact energy scale of inflation is. And if we find the energy scale, we'll have a lot more information about the nature of the inflaton field, the nature of quantum physics at very high energies, and uh, the kind of potential, the kind of universe that we live in. So this is really an important observational target at the moment. Now, as you see on the figure, there are two ways that we can go about this. We can try to detect those gravitational waves directly with gravitational wave detectors, like the ones that we have for this situation. But the ones that we currently have on Earth have not detecting them. They are probably not quite sensitive enough and not quite looking at the right frequencies. So this might be possible, but in the future, not, not in the immediate uh, not, not in the next few years, let's say. Maybe in the next few decades, we might try to go for direct detection. But for now, we are mostly focusing on indirect detection. What kind of imprint those gravitational waves would have left on the light of the CMB? 
And for this, uh, we, can, we have to look at what we call the polarization of light. So the density fluctuations are quite straightforward to see because they change the intensity of the light. But for gravitational waves, we have to look uh, in a bit more detail. So light is a wave you can see here propagating along that axis. It's made of an electrical field and a magnetic field. And what we call polarization is the direction in which the electric field oscillates. And now, if you look at this map here, the CMB light is polarized. You can see those little dark segments, that's uh, these little black, black lines. These are the polarization directions we've been able to measure at different places on this map of the, of the young universe. So if we only had density fluctuations, let's say we don't have the gravitational waves, we only have density fluctuations, those are quite simple. A density fluctuation is really just hot, cold, hot, cold, alternating regions, dense, under dense, denser, less dense, less dense. So it's, it's symmetrical. If you flip it, it looks the same. So if we only had the density fluctuations, we would expect all the polarization patterns to be what we call parity even. But if we have the gravitational waves, gravitational waves distort space-time. They are more complex geometrically and they don't have this symmetry. So if we have the gravitational waves, what we will see is this unique signature that we call B modes. And if you see, you flip them, they look the opposite. Those ones are the ones we're looking for. If we could detect those patterns in the CMB polarization, that would be the holy grail of early universe cosmology, pretty much. But this is a tremendous observational challenge. Because uh, what you can see here, so you, the way you can read this figure is just intensity of the fluctuations as a function of their size or scale. Uh, what we've been able to detect from the density perturbations are temperature fluctuations and E-mode polarization. And those fit really nicely with theory. Those have been detected. But now, where do we predict the B-modes? Most inflation theories, and this is still a huge value for the B-modes, this is like inflation theories that have actually already been ruled out because they are too high. These would predict the B modes to be there. And this axis is logarithmic, is powers of 10. So this means that the primordial B modes are orders of magnitudes fainter than all the other signals we've been able to, do, to measure in the CMB. It's very, very hard to see. And to complicate matters worse, our own galaxy is emitting polarized light that can interfere and the light from the CMB, of course, it doesn't reach us directly. It has to go all around the large scale structure of the universe all the way towards us. It also gets kind of deflected and distorted. So we've got to figure out how to remove all those effects and uh, design data analysis algorithms and have extremely sensitive instruments to try and detect those B modes. So here's an example of one of the instruments that we will be using and the one that I am working on uh, during my PhD. This is the very beautiful site of uh, Cerro Toco in Chile, where the Simons Observatory is currently in the late stages of construction. So it's of course very high in altitude, very pure atmosphere, not a lot of fluctuations uh, in the air. So that's, that's the advantage of being so high. And uh, the first light actually already happened. One of the instruments has already been uh, operational since last October. The other ones are still being built, but it is imminent that science observations will start. This is a closer look into what makes the Simons Observatory. It's actually not just one telescope, it's four of them. We've got these three telescopes that will look at a relatively small area of the sky, very, very sensitive. So they will focus on one area, but really have deep observations for five years on this to see the faintest possible signals. And then we have this other telescope, which is much larger, and we look at a bigger area of the sky, which will try to map all of the matter, all of the galaxies, all the large scale structure in the universe to try and undo all those deflections and lensing effects that affect our measurements. And overall, with this design, after five years of operations, this Simons Observatory should be about 10 times more sensitive than anything we've ever seen before. So this is a really exciting time. And in conclusion, this is what we know now, uh, what we suspect now is the history of our universe. We start with a very, very fast period of expansion that we call inflation. Uh, of course, the initial singularity, we still don't know how to describe it. There are still a lot of mysteries, a lot to be discovered. These quantum fluctuations during inflation get blown up to uh, macroscopic scales, forming density fluctuations that then explain the formation of all the large scale structures and uh, give rise to temperature and E-mode fluctuations in the CMB. 
We also have other quantum perturbations that end up being gravitational waves with this unique B-mode signature that we are now trying really hard to detect. Um, and uh, the Simons Observatory will start operations probably in summer 2024, and within the next five years, we'll have more and more accurate data on that. But the Simons Observatory is not alone. It's actually the precursor of a whole series of different experiments that will be um, planned for the next decade, so in the 2030s. And for example, CMBS-4, ground-based, Lightbird that we will send to space, and uh, even direct uh, observation experiments for the gravitational waves like LISA that has recently been approved. All of these mark the beginning of a really, really exciting era of potential breakthroughs and discoveries as we keep trying to search for those echoes of the Big Bang. Thank you for your attention. Yes. But you can't really detect artificially for light and quantum electrons. So is there anything that might be emitted by the plasma phase that we might be able to detect? Yes, exactly. So the, the, this first light of the universe, the CMB, is actually the light that was emitted right as atoms were forming when the universe was going through the transition between plasma and gas. And from this light, from the CMB, we recover the properties of that plasma. So we know that the plasma was in thermal equilibrium. It had a constant, uh, mostly uniform temperature, and it had those density variations. So we can infer all those properties from the light that was emitted right at the transition. It still bears all the, the marks before the universe started looking completely different with structure formation and all. So yeah, we, we don't see the light directly emitted in the plasma, but just as it was transitioning. Well, in, in the, um, the first phase of the universe, so during inflation, the universe was dominated by this scalar field. And in the case of a scalar field, uh, there's no electrical charge. So the particle is actually its own antiparticle, which is a little weird to wrap your, your head around. But um, yeah, so, so actually the inflaton field was its own antiparticle and could annihilate with itself. So... All that happened was that wherever particles or antiparticles, they are the same, were emitted, we had over densities in the end. But of course, there's another question where the antimatter, like where, where antimatter is now and why there was an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. But that's all questions for afterwards. Once all the particles of the standard model were created, then there was presumably some asymmetry and most of it annihilated, but what remained was the matter that we have today. This is unrelated to, to inflation itself. Uh, this is a, a different question that, that happens later in the universe. During inflation, it's, just, it's, it's actually the same. Yeah, so the, the matter we had today, we think was completely, well, was created after the inflation field decayed, so basically the inflate, in, inf, inflaton field decayed into the particles that we know today. And it must have decayed into matter and antimatter, both. But then, for some reason, and we don't know that, that reason yet, there was a bit more matter than antimatter, so most of it annihilated. And what remains now, the matter that we know now, is, is what remained after that. But uh, we don't quite know where, why it was asymmetrical. <laughs> the answer is we don't know, but we're trying to find out, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's not exactly my field, but that's also an active field of research. Uh, yes. Is, is the, the observatory in Chile, is that the only objective of that? To find no. Out? No, no, it has, it has many science goals. Uh, I'm, of course, focusing on this. But there are many other uh, types of information that we can extract from the CMB. 
Uh, for example, with this large aperture telescope, I'm saying in my case, the interest of the large aperture telescope is that it's going to map the structures of the universe. And that's interesting for my research because we'll be able to undo the deflection and distortion effects that result from that. But this in itself, a map of the structure of the universe is actually really interesting information. So what for me consists a problem, something to remove for some other scientists is a mine of information. So this is one of the, one of the goals is also to, to map the, the clustering, the, the, the formation of structure in the universe. And there's also even some galactic science and some other kinds of, uh, of science goals. So no, it's not the only goal, but it is the main one, I would say. Yes. Thank you.